This is the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast. I'm Oisín Langan. Coming up, former Shamrock Rovers and St. Pat's goalkeeper Barry Murphy on Shamrock Rovers 2-0 draw with Derry City. Dundalk have been sent to hell by Connacht, losing two games in a row. First at home to Galway and now to Sligo Rovers who beat them 5-0. Aoife Mullen will join us from the town. Drogheda United earned their first three points of the season, beating Bowles 2-1 thanks to a grant own goal and one from Evan Weir, which he scored direct from a free kick 10 yards inside his own half. If you haven't seen it, check it out. James Clark pulled one back for the visitors, but it wasn't enough. As well as all that, we'll be heading to Talca Park, where John Martin's goal gave top-of-the-table shells a 1-0 victory against Galway United. Now, as you can possibly gather, I'm at the RSC, where Waterford humbled St. Pat's 3-1, a third defeat in a row for the Saints. We'll have more on that later. Let's start, though, at Tallis Stadium, where the Hoops drew 2 all with the Foil Siders. All the goals coming in the second half, with Dara Burns putting the hosts 1-0 up before Hooban equalised from the spot and Mullen bundled home to make it 2-1. Burns turned provider for the uh, Rovers' equaliser, whipping it across to Poom who glanced at home. That goal scored in injury time. Here's Shamrock Rovers manager Stephen Bradley speaking to ExtraTime.com's McDara Ferris. Yeah, this team has that. They have tremendous character and spirit. We know that. Um, they never stop. Uh, I think the performance tonight deserved at least a point. I thought we should have won the game. We were really good until we scored and then we came off the game for 15 minutes. Um, we stopped pressing, we stopped playing, we stopped penetrating. And as a result, we allowed them into the game. And that's the only disappointment, uh, obviously, other than the goal. Um, but other than that I thought we were very very good it looked to be quite a soft penalty if I can say that I think you, you had a look back you probably had a better view maybe than, than we had when yeah. you looked back after the game yeah I've watched the back a few times the players are adamant you usually know by the players reaction they're adamant it was uh, incredibly soft Shamrock Rovers manager Stephen Bradley speaking to extratime.com's Mac Dara Ferris and you can hear more from that interview on the extratime.com League of Ireland podcast with Luke Jordan coming this Wednesday. We're joined now by former Shamrock Rovers and St. Pat's goalkeeper Barry Murphy. Uh, Barry, is 2 all a fair reflection of the game? I think both managers will probably feel they let something out there tonight. Uh, from a neutral's point of view, 2-2 two, two is probably a fair result, but Rovers hadn't gone 1-0 up to Burns early in the second half. We'll feel they, they should have gone on and, and, and grown into the game and, and got the three points, but... Uh, Hoban and, and Derry just showed that little bit of grit and now that maybe they've been missing over the over the last couple of seasons and Hoban drew in Dylan Watts with a, with a ball in from Ben Darty into Hoban and, and Watts just bundled them over in the box really kind of naive foul and something that uh, Hoban would have been kind of renowned for over the years that, that, that bit of nous and kind of felt Dylan Watts on his back and, and went down and, and got the penalty and a, and a great conversion as well to, to level the game up and it was just from the Rovers point of view it was just the concession from a, a corner kick was just so naive the, a, a ball into the kind of into the howling wind coming in towards the new north stand McMullen just floats one in knowing it's going to be taken in by the wind in towards the, the six yard box and, and Poles is stuck on his line in between Gaffney and, and the oncoming Mullen and, and he just bundles it over the line but just something that Rovers haven't been associated with for the last couple of seasons having that kind of weak midpoint to, in the centre of defence it just they don't look comfortable there at the moment over the last couple of games. and But they showed all their nous and, and their ch- kind of champions mentality over the last couple of seasons and, and got a really good equaliser in the 92nd minute. Great bit of work from Dara Burns down the right-hand side and floated a great ball in for, for Poons to attack. And uh, all in all, two, two all was probably a fair result on the night. I was only keeping one eye on the game because I was at the RSC. I had the Virgin Media coverage on, on the laptop in front of me. But at times, the hoops looked defensively ropey is that accurate or inaccurate I thought they looked really frail tonight uh, to be honest they started really well um, so in saying that Josh Honan started centre half and Dan Cleary in league race either side and he did really well up against Patrick Hoban um, he kept him nice and high although like Pat Hoban likes the ball into his feet so they kept him nice and high up away from the goal and all the spaces in behind for Michael Duffy he was winning his aerial duels with him but the second half, it just unraveled a little bit, like the first half an hour in, in Talca Park last week. Um, Michael Duffy and, and Ben Darty kind of caused most of the problems down that left-hand side, kind of exposed Dara Burns when he was pushing forward. And the, the penalty came from that. Ben Darty does, does really well to win the ball off Dara Burns on the byline. And 
uh, Pat Hoban chose all his kind of nous and, and experience and uh, just a little naive from Dylan Watts draws him in and bundles him over for, for a penalty. He's kind of looking for it, but um, Dylan Watts is duly obliged there. Um, to be so disappointed with the concession of the goal from the corner. It's You know it's a windy night in Tala and the wind blows off that mountain down into that north stand and McMullen just sticks a ball up into the six-yard box and you're looking for your, your keeper or a strong centre-half to go out and win that header and clear the danger and it just didn't come and it falls to, to Mullen who bundles it over the line and there's a couple of other good chances as well. It's just, it's very young rovers like at the back. They, they built their kind of success on the solid foundation of, of the, the defence and, and pushing off from there. And it's just not there quite at the moment. There is a danger that we obsess on Shamrock Rovers, but let's talk about Derry City. I'm sure Rory Higgins, the manager, would have taken a draw beforehand, but is probably heading back up the road quite disappointed that they didn't win. Yeah, I was really impressed with Derry tonight. Um, Rory went to his, his usual Tala formation of, of three at the back with McJanus, Connolly and McElhenney. Um, I, I think the game probably went as he envisioned it would go. Um, Michael Duffy caused all sorts of problems for down the left-hand side, pushing Dara Burns back, which is probably what he wanted to do. He obviously wanted him facing his own goal and not running at you, but he caused all sorts of problems down there, Michael Duffy. And yeah, with with Patrick McElhenney missing in the middle and, and patching would have started. I think he was on the, the, the team sheet that was handed out to the media, but obviously didn't come out and uh, was replaced by McIniff in the starting lineup. He probably had to change things around a little bit, but overall, really impressive. Adam Riley was breaking things up in the middle, winning the balls back and, and starting counter attacks. And it was a really good away performance for, from Derry. Um, it was probably going exactly to plan until until Tara Burns got that goal. A really, uh, a really good finish. But maybe Brian Maher would be a little disappointed with with the concession of it. Just went underneath his body. But from then, Derry showed all the grit that that Rovers would have been known for over the, the last couple of years to, to to come back from that and and go into the lead. And they they look good for three points at that point. And they'd be really disappointed with the concession of the late goal. But I think if you'd have handed. Uh, if you'd have said to, to Rory Higgins you'll, you'll take a point and, and head back up the road I think after the game on Friday night getting a late winner and, and four points from two of your main rivals I think he, he would have snapped your hand off a really good performance and, and night to work from Derry A goal off the bench on Friday night for Danny Mullen a goal off the bench tonight for Danny Mullen there is a real danger that he'll make himself into a super sub which is a role I don't think any player particularly wants he did really well when he came on uh, with about 10 minutes to go. He came on for uh, Jordan McIniff and was a real handful up front from, uh, for Derry. And he yeah, did really well. It's probably a contentious one. If you, if you look back and I've just seen a couple of angles now, it looks like he might have used his hand to bun- bundle it over the line, but we'll not take that away from him. I think there's plenty of bodies in front of the ref and, and the linesman that uh, blocked their point of view. But no, that's, listen, you, you want goals and, and that's what he's done the last couple of games. He's come on and got goals and, uh, you don't want to be doing from the bench and I'm sure he'll get his chance to, to start one of, the, one of the games coming up it's a, it's a pretty packed fixture list coming up as well so uh, listen it bodes well when, when you've got lads coming off the bench as well as your, your main striker and hoping scoring goals so it's looking good for them This is the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast and that was Barry Murphy on Shamrock Rovers 2 all draw with Derry City now in the background you're hearing the full time atmosphere from Oriel Park, where Sligo Rovers hammered Dundalk by five goals to nil. You're actually hearing mostly Sligo Rovers fans there uh, because they were delighted with the win and why wouldn't they be? So they're singing their hearts out. But if you listen closely, you can hear a little bit of frustration and you can hear some of the Dundalk fans venting their anger. Extratime.com's Aoife Mullen was at the game and afterwards sent us this voice note. Sligo were without a win in eight games coming into this match but they started really lively. The first goal came from Chapman. He fired home after some good build-up play from Hartman and Max Mata and then Hartman himself was on the score sheet from a shot from about 25 yards out that the keeper really should have dealt with. The visitors looked dangerous and a third goal really was inevitable. That goal then came after 33 minutes and from from a Dundalk point of view another calamitous defensive error which Chapman was able to capitalise on and get a second goal. And then Max Mata, well, Hutchinson found Mata in plenty of space 
and he was easily able to slot home that fourth goal. A four goal cushion going into the halftime break meant that there really looked like there was only going to be one w- winner in this game and it was going to be damage limitation from a Dundalk point of view. Stephen O'Donnell made a couple of changes. Mayoa and Amashahoon, who went down in the first half, got a bit of a knock. Well, he was taken off and Louis Ansley came on for his first appearance of this season. And Ross Munro replaced George Shelby, the goalkeeper, in nets for the second half. That was Munro's debut for Dundalk. And I suppose, but for a couple of saves that he made, it could have been a heavier defeat, but he was unable to do anything about Matta's second goal, which came after 62 minutes and with a scoreline of 5-0. Again, that was the nail in the coffin. Ironically, on a night that the local funeral directors sponsored this match, but it never looked like Dundalk were going to to be able to match Sligo's quality. And they were very much on on top at that point. Horgan and Durant had a couple of chances, but again, overall, there just seemed to be a lack of cohesion and evidence of of the fact that a lot of new players have come into Dundalk in the off-season still possibly haven't gelled and and need more time. And we're three games in, it's still early days in the season, but Dundalk now find themselves at the very bottom of the table with just one solitary point. That coming from their draw on the opening day of the season. Dundalk's next game, well, it's not an easy trip. It's Richmond Park on Friday night where they'll face St. Pat's. And meanwhile, Sligo Rovers, well, they face Shamrock Rovers and they'll be going into that one on Friday, brimming with confidence after their emphatic victory in Oriel Park today. So it finished here in a wet, windy and miserable Oriel Park. Dundalk nil, Sligo Rovers 5. Peter Luger is not convincing at full Salmon, who makes it 2-1. The cross in from Burke. Peter Luga with a weak punch. It fell to Aaron on the edge of the six yard box on the left side. And he just sent in his second. Asamoah breaks through the middle. He's inside the same path half. He's up against Redmond approaching the box. Asamoah. It's 3 1 to Waterford. He took it to Redmond's right and put it onto his left. Then sent it flying past the goalkeeper who's beaten for the third time tonight. 70 minutes gone, Waterford FC 3, St. Pat's 1. This is the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast and we're joined on the side of the pitch by St. Patrick's Athletic Manager John Daly. John, a 3-1 defeat here uh, to Waterford. Unfortunately for Pat's a third defeat on the bounce. What are your what are your thoughts on the on the game? Yeah, obviously huge disappointment. Um, I thought we we started poorly. It's a... Uh, it's a, an easy kind of goal we gave them to, to start off. Obviously, um, we didn't pick up and he gets a free header and give ourselves a mountain to climb. We kind of started to get a foothold back in the game, um, obviously into that strong breeze. Um, and we do well. We got a good goal back in it with, with Anto Breslin. And we had a couple of moments then. I felt that if we'd have been a bit more aggressive with our um, attacking play, we would have got... Um, another opportunity some good balls put in the box and um, and then the second goal obviously is a mistake again so um, so yeah it just, it just seems at this moment in time we're in a tough spot that every every little error or every mistake we make seems to be punished Is it a systems error are the players not following instructions are the players just not playing well enough what, what's going wrong? No I think I don't think it's um, I don't think it's that anything from the player's point of view. I think, as I said, it's individual errors that are being, you know, significantly punished. And then, um, you know, but we, I'll obviously take responsibility myself as the manager. It's, uh, it's my responsibility to try and get results, and um, we'll be working extremely hard to make sure we we bounce back on Friday and get ourselves another three points on the board and start to climb that league table and and close the gap. I think it's very very tight. It's early days, and um, it just now becomes a, a situation where we've given ourselves no real room for error um, we need to get ourselves back in into the pack as quickly as possible um, you know and that, that starts on Friday and finally for me how confident are you that you can get this right because we've seen teams in all leagues in all countries start slowly and get better and things start to click and players start to get match fit and things gel how confident are you that that can happen no we've got a firm belief in, in the group that are in there I really do I've said that to them in there like a massive belief that they can they can go and achieve this year and I think um, you know we have had a high turnover of players and that's not me making standing here making the excuse we have there's still you know players that are looking to try and build relationships and um, the quicker that happens the better Um you know, but you know, I need to look at it and try and get us to be more of an attacking threat, and that's that's something we'll do now over the next two, three, four days before we play Dundalk on Friday, and I expect that come Friday, 
the fans will see a team that are you know hungry to go and get three points. Cheers, John. Thank you. This is the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast and we're at the RSC where Waterford have beaten St. Pat's by three goals to one. Melise Asamoah scoring a goal and winning the Man of the Match award. Melise, just before we started this interview on the podcast, I've played the moment where your name was announced on the tannoy as the player of the match. So everyone listening has heard it, but did you hear it at the time? And if so, what was your, what was your reaction? Uh, obviously, because I was cramping up towards the end, so I went down to the bench for a bit. But I sat there just watching the game, and the boys were like, did you just hear that? I was like, what? And they said, you got Man of the Match. I was like, I've never had Man of the <laughs> I've never had Man of the Match before. This is my first senior Man of the Match, because I've just obviously became a pro, so it was a big moment for me, and I was, I was shocked when I heard it. You've brought an awful lot of pace, but also skill to this Waterford team. Is that the instruction to you? Get Waterford high up the pitch, get them up there quickly. Yeah, that's my main goal. I'm, I'm just, I love attacking. That's obviously that's what I grew up doing, and the skills and the pace is just something I was born with, and I'm, I'm grateful to God for that. But yeah, I just the main aim is to get get forward and get goals, get assists, and just get winning. Speed can kind of come naturally, but the skills you have, that has to be honed. So talk to me about how you've worked on that over the. T- well, years leading up to you coming to Waterford. Yeah, obviously, I'm dedicated to football. Football's my life. If I didn't have football, I don't even know what I'd be doing. So I put my time, my effort, my life into football and, and it's paying off. I feel like I'm reaping the rewards and I'm just grateful for, for the amount of work that me and my family are putting. And it's, yeah, it's showing. You must love this then. You two games here this season and two goals. Yeah, I love the RSC. I love Blocky. I love the whole group. I love the chant. I love this place. It's great. It's great. <laughs> And how did you end up in Waterford? Um, obviously, I'm, I'm alone from Fleetwood. And I'm getting minutes with the first team, but I'm not getting as much as needed. So here to just play senior football and, and get the starts and the minutes that I'm, I'm needing in professional men's football. Yeah, and you must love it so far. But that's amazing. Couldn't, couldn't change it for anything. I know you probably didn't know much about Waterford before you came here, but you're getting to love the place, aren't you? Oh, the place is amazing. The people are so nice. and Yeah, I love it. Actually, I really am enjoying it. You're playing for the Blues and you're going blue. So one last question. You've had a great start. The team have had a great start. How is it all coming together? Is it how has it got to the point where it's now, is it uh, two wins from four? And even in the game you lost on Friday, you could have got a result. We've got a great, great group of players. Everyone has each other's back. We fight for one another. There's no, there's no egos in the team. Even if you're, you're, you're 21 or you're older than Pudge, <laughs> you can talk to one another, uh, you can let them know how it is and everyone will respect each other as an equal and I feel that's what's that's really a big thing on the team. Please tell me you're calling Pudge granddad. Pudge is my, my granddad. <laughs> <laughs> well done tonight, Melise. Well, this is the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast and we're in the dugout at the RSC following Waterford's 3-1 victory against St. Patrick's Athletic. Alan Reynolds, Waterford assistant manager, you must have been very happy with what you saw tonight. Yeah, I look really happy. You thought... Uh... I suppose we were we were disappointed after Friday. Um, got what we deserved really, but we just you know we had a goal tonight and and really went after. I suppose Pat's the conditions weren't great, but um, no, we've some exciting uh, players. You know, we'll get better as the season goes on. Talk to me about uh, Malice Asimov, player of the match tonight, and in two games here he scored twice. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's exciting. That's for sure. He can be frustrating and, and at times as well. But uh, one thing for sure, he can run. Um, and as a threat, you know, other I suppose the defenders are looking and going, try how we deal with him. Um, he, get, he needs to get better at certain aspects, but I'm sure he will. And uh, we've got to keep working with him because he's a young player. Your recruitment so far looks like it's excellent. Radkowski is uh, strong at the back. Obviously, there's lads who were here last year as well. Uh, O'Keefe and Dara Power, the other Dara who came in, Dara Leahy, he's playing well. Um, like there's a nice mix of the lads who were here and the guys you've brought in and they seem to have gelled together quite quickly yeah well look I, I think if you look down through the years Cork for example you know left it late or, or was too late to get players in because of the takeover and that and we knew from that we knew we needed to make changes and players needed to be added and there's been probably 10 or more have come in and 10 or so that have stayed so it's up over pre-season we took time and, and made sure we, the signings were the right type like Daryl Lee is a good leader he's a good type and obviously Paulie Gammon as well so I suppose recruitment is down to the manager and it's been very good. It's been a good start here. 
does that change the ambitions? Does that reset the ambitions? What does it do? No, it doesn't change it. No, we do, we're not looking too far ahead. Like obviously we have Derry this weekend, who are, you know, I'm sure they're looking to win the league. We have different uh, aims, you know, which we will keep in house. But um, we just want to try and get better and pick up points as we go. Derry City, of course, got a, a two-all draw away to Shamrock Rovers last night. Will you? Um, Go into particular detail in that game, or does your experience in Derry have any relevance on that? Ah, yeah, but look, I mean, I know all the players that are up there, bar you know one or two that they've signed, but you'd know them as well. And knowing them and trying to stop them are two different things. Uh, they're really good, and I'm sure after conceding late uh, against Rovers, they'll be wounded and looking for a result. So we'll have to be at our best, that's for sure, to get out not them. And when Derry were looking for a new assistant manager, it's a compliment to you. Your name was linked to it. But you stayed here. Now, whether or not it was uh, 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 truly or accurately reported, I don't know. But the fact that you did stay here says what you think of this club and what's going on here in the project. Yeah, but come here. There was lots of rumours about it and there was plenty of names mentioned with it. But uh, all I know, David, good Paul hegarty has gone in there. Good man. Good manager. And uh, look, we move on. That's football. And, and uh, we'll be, we're will be we all winners at the end of the day. So I'm sure it might be uh, lively on the, on the sideline on Friday night. There's a buzz about this place at the moment. Now, you've had buzzes before. And they haven't lasted. How confident and hopeful are you that you can keep this going? Well, I think uh, with the new owners that are here, I think they're really good. And they're the best I've seen, actually, in my time that I've been involved with Waterford, which is a long, long time. Real stable. They have you know, plans where they want to go to the club and they want to grow. So it's it's fantastic to see that, um, you know, whether I'm here or not here. Uh, I've been keeping an eye from the outside and I just think it's, it's exciting times. And, and there's a new, younger generation getting behind and supporting and following the team. And... Uh, as long as we can keep chipping away. It was hard in the first division, but now they're getting to see some of the top teams in the country, top players in the country, coming here to play. And it's good for the kids and it's good for everyone. And finally, Padraig Gammond, he looks like he's a great bit of business. We can all see on the field what he's bringing, but what's he bringing around the place and to these young players? Just a touch of class. He's a touch of class on and off the pitch, uh, wants to help the players, knows what he's come into, you know, sees younger players and how can I improve them and gives little bits of nuggets to them to help them. So, fantastic sign and we're delighted to have him. Alan Reynolds, thanks for talking thanks. to the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast. Thanks. Good luck. All the reaction from the RSC were Waterford enjoyed a great 3-1 victory over St. Pat's. 3,076 people attended the game which is not bad considering how miserable a day it was in Waterford all day but I'll bet the ones who went along are delighted they did because they were treated to a good show right let's go to Talca Park where Shelburne overcame Galway United by one goal to nil we'll hear from Shell's captain Mark Coyle shortly but first ExtraTime.com's Andrew Dempsey was there and afterwards sent us this voice note Hey O'Shane um, yeah just finished up here at Talca Park where it has finished Shelburne won, Go United nil. Shells are now top of the league. I know it's only four games in, but um, still top. Um, don't think that's a, a mean feat for anybody. Yeah, Galway started probably the better of the two teams. They were quick out the blocks. They they put pressure on without really creating an awful lot. Um, they had a decent enough opening through a kind of a set piece routine where David Hurley and Conor McCormick combined. Um, McCormick put a ball in, kind of just skewed past ahead of a Galway player um, or a host of Galway players even where you know if they, if there was a touch it was probably going to be going to be a goal and um, look obviously it didn't go in and um, Shells made them pay for that start in terms of you know Galway not being able to create too much and not being able to convert when Shells took the lead uh, Will Jarvis went on a, on a good run after Paddy Barrett won possession and um, ball fell to Mark Coyle and then he passed it on to Evan Caffrey he ended up finding Will Jarvis and Will Jarvis kind of cut in from the left hit a shot that kind of came off the post and looked like it was about to go out for a goal kick and um, John Martin was on the essentially on the byline really and uh, managed to turn it home from a very very acute angle to make it 1-0 and yeah um, there wasn't really too many clear cut opportunities after that like I think to be fair to Galway they, they were always a threat but without actually looking like scoring too much Um their best chance probably came late on when, when Patrick Hickey kind of dragged the shot just wide and I think at that stage the game was quite stretched. Shells had a chance to make it 2-0 at the very end um, but Tyreek Wilson put it wide on the counter-attack even. So yeah, look, overall I think Shells probably shaded it and probably deserved to win but I think if Galway got an equaliser I don't think they could have complained too much about that. The, the crowd that they got there tonight was absolutely fantastic. They got, I think it was just just over 3,700, 3,773 to be exact. 
if I'm not mistaken. And um, I remember being a talk a couple of years ago for, look, I know they were in the first division. I know times weren't great, but they were getting, I think, just over 400 to games. And the fact that they're now getting you know, nearly 4,000 people to, to games in the Premier Division on a Monday night is, is fantastic. And it probably goes to show how far the club has, has pushed on in recent years. So, yeah, look, overall, a great night for Shells. Um, to be fair to Galway, I don't think they can lose too much hard from it. They they were very, very much in the game. They weren't too far off it. And look, I think if Galway play like that for in most games this season, they'll pick up points and they should be more than more than fine in terms of the relegation battle. But yeah, um, yeah, final score at, at talk it was 1-0 to Shells. Extratime.com's Andrew Dempsey on Shelburne's 1-0 victory against Galway United. After the match, he caught up with Shelburne captain Mark Coyle and asked him his thoughts on the performance and the victory. Yeah, uh, Galway are a tough opposition to play against. Um, they'll give many teams a problem this year. Um, so look, <coughs> we'll take the 1-0 win and we'll move on quickly. Yeah, was it a relief to get the win? Or maybe you're, you're um, overriding emotion from that. Are you happy, you're relieved? Or, or how do you feel that? Obviously happy to get the three points, but nothing more than that, I would say. Um, probably a wee bit relieved after going down the 10 minutes with went off injured at the end, but... I think we were very comfortable throughout the game and uh, deserved three points. Yeah, and how good is Will? Because obviously he's been here last season. He's he's really got that <coughs> that flair about him, doesn't he? Yeah, definitely. Look, you can see it there when he's dribbling with the ball. How many people he can just glide past? But he just seems to glide with the ball. Uh, other people are bobbling, but it just seems to be stuck to his foot. And he's a game changer. And look, that's we're delighted to have him back, and hopefully it continues that way. Yeah, I know it's probably something different. I know that you had a great side against Shamrock Rovers in that game. Kind of had to held on a bit towards the end. Obviously, probably today had a bit of a slower start against Galway, but he obviously managed to win. Probably that shows a good side of your game, though. Yeah, look, I'd say we have a lot more to give as well um, in terms of on the ball at the minute. Uh, but if you're winning games, that's the most important thing, especially at the start of the season. But look, we're not getting too far ahead of ourselves. Look, we've been on a massive game now on Friday, and that's what we're looking forward to now. Yeah, I think I spoke to you before the Shamrock Rovers game, and I, I asked you how close do you feel you are to Shamrock Rovers, and look, obviously you managed to get over Shamrock Rovers, you're top of the league. It's the limit for this group, isn't it? Oh, look, as I said, look, I'm not going to go out there and say yeah. something that we are, we aren't. Look, we're going well, and I think that is the most important thing, staying grounded and realising that the next game is the most important, and um, the managers... That's what he reiterates to us every day, um, and that's what we believe as a group because that's what matters. Um, I said, I think I said that in the press conference. If you get too far ahead of yourself, you end up losing your way, and we're not doing that. Um, yeah, it's a great start, but as I said, we've got a lot more to give as well. So hopefully, that's the way it continues. A massive crowd here tonight. I think three thousand seven hundred and seventy-three, which is like even last season you had that on a Friday night. That would be a great, great crowd, and to get that on a Monday, it probably shows how, how far you. Yeah. I suppose you guys have come as a club and as a team. Yeah, definitely. Look, it's great to have the fans there, especially on a Monday night. And it was a wet Monday night at that yeah. as well. So to have that many fans out, big respect to them. And look, we love them being here. They actually do drive us on. It does make that difference, especially when you hear them singing and that. So look, for us, it's massive that they are there. And as I said, if we keep winning and they keep coming, hopefully that's the way it goes. Yeah, because I know it can kind of be a cliche, can't it, with those messages? But because I suppose it, it does generally feel like that they actually do make a difference here. Oh, 100 percent they do. Yeah, definitely. If you look at the river end and different sides. Like it's, they actually do add that. But uh, you know, that just give you that bit of extra when it's the going gets tough or you know you want a corner. That that all adds up to momentum and gives you a foothold in the game. So yeah, they do play a massive part in games. Shelburne captain Mark Coyle speaking to ExtraTime.com's Andrew Dempsey following their 1-0 victory against Galway United at Tolka Park. That's almost it for the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast. Let's just round up the results. Bohemians losing 2-1 away to Drogheda United after the game Bowls manager Declan Devine said the two goals they gave away were horrendous. Drogheda United manager Kevin Doherty was somewhat happier. He said he felt it in the warm-up that they were going to produce a performance and they certainly did. In Oriel Park, Dundalk losing 5-0 to Sligo Rovers. Shelburne, as we've covered, beating Gowie United by one goal to nil. Waterford, 3-1 victors against St. Pat's and Derry City drawing 2 all away to Shamrock Rovers. How does that make the table look? Well, Shelburne are top on 10 points. Derry second on 8 points. Waterford third on 7 points. Galway fourth on 6 points. Sligo Rovers fifth on uh, 5 points. Bowles sixth on 4 points. Drogheda seventh on 3 points. St. Patrick's Athletic, 8th on 3 points. Shamrock Rovers, ninth on 2 points. And Dundalk, bottom of the table on 1 point. Let's take a look ahead to Friday 
and uh, remind you of the fixtures. In the Premier Division, it's Bohemians against Shelburne, Derry City against Waterford, Galway against Drogheda and St. Pat's taking on Dundalk. All of those games kick off at 7.45 in the First Division on Friday. It's at Lone Town against Kerry. Kerry, by the way, reached the Munster Senior Cup uh, final, beating Treaty United last night. So congratulations to them. Uh, in the other games on Friday night, Finn Harps take on Cove Ramblers, Treaty United, who have won three from three in the First Division so far. Well, they're at home to Bray Wanderers and UCD welcome Wexford. In the Men's Premier Division on Saturday, Sligo Rovers taking on Shamrock Rovers. Kickoff is at 7.45. In the First Division, Longford Town welcome Cork City. The Women's Premier Division gets underway this weekend. Shelburne taking on Sligo Rovers at 2. At 3, it's DLR Waves against Shamrock Rovers. At 5, it's Cork City against Piedmont United. At 6, it's Wexford taking on Bowes. And at 7.30, at Lone Town take on Galway United. All of those games will be live on LOI TV and TG Carr of course will be showing uh, games in the uh, Women's Premier Division again this year. That's it from the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast. Don't forget Luke will be back on Wednesday with a deep dive into everything that's happening in the league. As always you can find me on at Oshin Langan and you can find the Extra Time contact details through the website ExtraTime.com Until next time take care. Bye bye.